our Father who art in heaven. You don't have to be a Christian to know the words to that prayer. It's very old. But it's not as old as the idea of praying to a God as though he were a Father in heaven. That's really old and really widespread. You have Sky Father gods among some Native American tribes. In the Pacific, the Polynesians have a Sky Father. You've even got a Sky Father god in Sumeria, in ancient Mesopotamia. But just because there are all these different gods from around the world that are seen as Sky Fathers, that doesn't mean they all come from a common source. Rather, it just seems mankind is prone to perceiving a god of this kind. But there are some Sky Father deities in diverse religions that do have a common origin. I'm referring to the Indo-European Sky Fathers in religions such as the, those of the ancient Greeks and the Hindus of India. That's because they all derive from the Proto-Indo-European religion of the Proto-Indo-European people who lived on the steppes of Eastern Europe between the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. These ancient people of the steppes worshipped a sky father who they called Dies Pater. The steppes of Russia and Ukraine are wide stretching grasslands which are hot in summer and cold in winter. They are ideally suited for the pastoral lifestyle of the Proto-Indo-European language speakers, who are associated with the Sredni Stog, Yamnaya and Corded Ware archaeological cultures. They domesticated the ancestors of our modern horses, and used these swift beasts to help them round up herds of cattle which they drove across vast grazing territories. The daylight sky stretches above the steppe as an endless and powerful presence, and it is this presence that gave rise to their belief in the Sky Father. Dios Pater. He helped to create the world using the first sacrifice. He gave man cattle so that they could offer sacrifice in return. The sun is his eye or lamp, represented by a separate sun goddess. The dawn is another goddess, and she too is his daughter. The horse-riding twin gods are his sons. They spawned noble races of men on earth. The dragon-slaying storm god of the rains is his strongest ally. The earth goddess is his consort. He impregnates her and thus makes the earth fertile so that she will yield crops. While she was associated with moisture, swamps and soil, he was associated with the endless daylight sky. Professor David Anthony says, The speakers of late Proto-Indo-European expressed thanks for sons, fat cattle and swift horses to Sky Father. Dios Pter a male god whose prominence probably reflected the importance of fathers and brothers in the herding units that compose the core of earthly social organization. The idea of a Proto-Indo-European religion is nearly as old as the discovery of the Proto-Indo-European language by Sir William Jones in 1786. Having already realized that Latin, Greek and Sanskrit all derive from a common language, he later commented, When features of resemblance too strong to have been accidental are observable in different systems of polytheism without fancy or prejudice to colour them and improve the likeness, we can scarce help believing that some connection has immemorially subsisted between the several nations who have adopted them. So even though they left no written language and archaeology reveals very little about their religion, we can still understand lots about the Proto-Indo-European religion through a combination of comparative mythology, simply looking at parallels in different Indo-European myths, and also through linguistics, where we often see that the names of gods in different languages are cognates derived from a common root. 
The name Dios stems from the root Dio, denoting the daylight sky. Cognates in various Indo-European languages relate either to the sky or the gods, revealing this prehistoric association due to an original deity who was himself associated with the sky in the daytime. Examples include Old Irish Dia, Sanskrit Deva, Latin Dei, Old Norse Tiver, all mean gods. They are all cognate with the Proto-Indo-European word meaning daylight sky. Djaus. And this is combined with the word for father, Peter, to make the name Skyfather. According to pagan legends surviving among Lithuanian peasants, Dievus was their god of the sky. His name is also derived from that word for sky, as is the name of the chief deity of the ancient Greeks, Zeus. The Roman equivalent of Zeus was Jupiter, whose name comes from Proto-Italic Zeus, meaning day or sky, combined with Peter, meaning father. Thus his name means sky father and is directly descended from the name of the Proto-Indo-European god. Zeus was also referred to as Zeus Peter, sky father. In India, the ancient holy text referred to a god named Dyaus. He is not an important god even in the earliest text, the Rig Veda, and he becomes even less so in later texts. But we see clues that he was once more prominent based on his name and family relations. Dyaus means sky, but is also the name of the god who we know was seen as a father because he is also referred to as Dyaus Peter, sky father. He is usually coupled with the earth goddess most often in the dual form, Java Priti. His role as father is often emphasized. The dawn goddess, Ushas, is his daughter. Agni, the fire god, is his son, or his grandson. He is also father of Ratri, who is mother of Surya, the sun god, whose daughter is Surya, who marries both of the Ashvin horse twins, who are the Devo Napata the sons or grandsons of her own great-grandfather, Dias Peter. The complex relationships here reveal an underlying Indo-European solar myth which is not fully understood. This Vedic Skyfather is also referred to many times as the bull, which is an animal we might associate with the Skyfather, as I shall explain later. Sometimes the gods in Indo-European religions whose names derive directly from the Skyfather, are not themselves primary deities like he originally was. This is because religions change a lot over thousands of years. Another example can be seen in the Old Norse god of the Vikings called Tyr, also known as Tyu by the Anglo-Saxons, and from whom we take the name of the second day of the week, Tuesday. Tyr was not a father god, nor was he associated with the sky. Georges Dumézil, a pioneer in comparative Indo-European mythology, identified Tyr with the sovereign function of order and justice based partly on his epithets relating to the thing, which is an assembly, and also his similarity to other gods who have one or no hands in Indo-European myths. Sometimes Dumézil's sovereign gods of justice relate to the Skyfather, as in the case of the Roman Jupiter, but not always. Tyr and Tyu derive from the Proto-Germanic Tiwas, from Indo-European Dewo, from which Sanskrit Deva and Latin Deus also derive, and it means a god whose essence contains the light of heaven. The word Tyr is used in Old Norse to refer not just to Tyr himself, but to any god. So his name literally means God, not Sky, and he is never called Skyfather. The obvious Skyfather in Norse religion is the chief god, Odin, who was known as Alfother, which might mean the father of all. In Ireland, their Skyfather, the Dagda, was known as Echu Olathir, Echu, father of all. The Skyfather 
often bears the standard epithet all-knowing or all-seeing, such as in Greek, Eriopa, Zeus, or in the Rig Veda, Vishvavedas, Dyaus. Odin is certainly a father to many gods in the mythology, including Thor, Baldr, and Vidr, and he is the consort of Jorth, who is Mother Earth, just as other Sky Fathers are. In the case of Odin, we rely more on his mythic roles to identify his position as Sky Father, while with Zeus, we rely as much on the etymology of his name. In each Indo-European example, we need to look at both to get a clear picture of the original Sky Father, and sometimes we find that his roles and aspects are shared by more than one deity in a derivative pantheon. For example, another Norse god, Heimdall, also resembles the Sky Father in several ways. He is a father to all men, having sired the three castes in the Rigsthula, and he is also all-seeing and watches over the worlds from a celestial position. The cosmogenesis myth of the Proto-Indo-Europeans and the role of the Sky Father in it have been plausibly reconstructed by scholars such as Professor David Anthony and Bruce Lincoln. At the dawn of time, there existed two twin brothers, one named Manu, man, and the other, Yemo, twin. They fared through the cosmos with a primordial cow. The twins agreed to perform the first ever sacrifice in order to create the world. In some versions, man sacrifices his brother twin. In others, the two sacrifice the cow together. The sky gods, sky father, storm god, and the divine twins used the body parts of the sacrificial victim to construct different parts of the world. This myth reveals the establishment of priesthood and sacrifice was linked to the creation of the world itself, and therefore every following sacrifice re-establishes the primordial act of creation. Manu was the first priest. He established order against chaos, which is to be maintained by all Indo-European religions. Manu makes the sun, moon, sea, earth and fire, and the many races of man. Then the Sky Father gave the gift of cattle to Trito, the third man. But they were stolen by the many-headed dragon, Nukui, which means negation. Third man prayed to the Storm God for help, and so the Storm God slew the dragon with a bludgeoning weapon, most likely a stone axe, and became the first dragon slayer. Third man became the first warrior and gave the cattle to the priests so that they could be sacrificed to the sky gods who would receive their rightful share of this wealth. And thus, the sacred reciprocal cycle of giving between man and god would be maintained. Eastern versions of the myth appear to derive from a version in which an ox or a bull is sacrificed with Yemu, and this is then used to create all things while the Western ones derive from a version with a primordial female cow who functions as a mother, nursing and caring for the divine twins prior to the act of creation. And we see this, for example, in the Roman foundational myth, where the cow is supplanted with a she-wolf who nurses Romulus and Remus. The Sky Father clearly had a role in the creation myth, but it varies. However, his name clearly distinguishes him as a celestial god distinct from earthbound entities such as humans, whose name is derived from earth. Latin homo, meaning man, comes from humus, meaning soil, and like Old Irish, dunya, human, derived from Proto-Indo-European, dechion, 
which means soil. The Earth Mother is also absent in the creation myth, and was clearly not one of the sky gods. Yet she must have existed in the Proto-Indo-European religion, since she is so often found to be the consort of the Sky Father. Catonic deities of this kind were associated with the social sphere, caves, swamps and wet places, rather than the cosmic sphere of existence which pertained to the Sky Father. Most of the goddesses found in later Indo-European religions are actually derived from pre-Indo-European substrate religions that were integrated into Indo-European religion. The union of the Sky Father and the Earth Mother has already been mentioned in relation to Odin and Yurth, as well as in India with Tiaus and Prithvi Earth, and the same pairing can be seen in ancient Greece. The most obvious Greek reflection of this kind of hieros gamos, that is sacred marriage of god and goddess, is the coupling of Uranos and Gaia, who is Mother Earth, but it is also reflected in Zeus's hierogamy with Hera in the Iliad, where their sexual intercourse was seen as conducive to vegetative flourishing. Dumasil brought both the trifunctional hypothesis and the concept of dual representation of sovereignty to the school of Indo-European comparative mythology. He focused on sovereign gods, often coming in pairs, as distinct from sky gods. For example, he identifies Mitra and Varuna as sovereign gods in Vedic religion, while Dyaus was merely a Vedic sky god. However, in Rome, he also identifies the cult of Jupiter with the cult of Dius Fidius, a god whose name is also cognate with Dyaus and who was associated with oaths and justice. It is unclear whether Sky Father was the highest of gods and held a sovereign function for Proto-Indo-Europeans, or whether a different god was the sovereign and highest. Zeus was obviously the most important Greek god, and his name makes it obvious he is the Sky Father, but he also has many attributes of the Storm God. He is associated with rain and thunderbolts, but he was also associated with divine justice, Dika, just like Sanskrit, Disa, meaning direction, which goes with Sanskrit, Dahman, which is the law associated with the sovereign Vedic god, Varuna. Zeus also has pre-Indo-European influences, particularly from Crete, where he was viewed as a divine child sheltered in a cave, nurtured by bees and suckled by a goat. Poseidon, although a sea god, also derives in part from the Sky Father. He sires famous horses such as Arion and Pegasus and was associated with earthquakes. The sea association was actually a later addition with the result that he usurped previous Greek sea gods such as Nereus and Proteus. It seems Poseidon and Zeus were originally the same god until they were divided into brothers sometime in the second millennium before Christ. One of the principal aspects of the Sky Father, one that I've already mentioned, is that he was the father of the divine horse twins. In India, these twins are the horse riding Ashvins of the Rig Veda, who were known as Nasacha, rescuers, and Dasra, wonder workers. They are in fact closely matched by the Greek Dioskoroi, Zeus's boys called Castor and Polydukes. Polydukes' father was Zeus, but Castor's father was Tindaurus, yet they are somehow still twins, and it seems possible the same was true in India where Nasacha may be the original Ashvin, while his brother Dasra was the one descended from the god Dyaus. There is another parallel in the Baltic, Latvian, Dieva Deli, sons of God, and in England's foundational myth in the form of the euhemerized horse twins Hengist and Horsa, the progenitors of the English race who claimed descent from the sky father Woden. 
I already mentioned that the Sky Father was placated through sacrifices which harken back to the primordial sacrifice and the gift of cattle from the Sky Father to mankind. While it seems sacrifices of horses were associated with kingship, such as in the rite of the Ashvamedha, cattle were more commonly offered in the Indo-European religions to various kinds of deities and were regarded as more valuable sacrifices than sheep or goats. Jan Puvel takes a slightly different view when he defines an Indo-European sacrificial hierarchy which corresponds to the hierarchy of the social castes. The upper tier includes stallions and bulls, and possibly humans, and all three are associated with the ruling and warrior castes. Goats, pigs and other animals are left for the farmers and other lower castes, as are normal cattle, with some exceptions such as bulls. The position of rams and sheep is unclear, as they sometimes go at the bottom, but are also associated with the highest priestly caste. The prominence of the holy cow in Indian religion is well known, and I already explained it in more detail in a video on sacred cows. In Norse sources, there are two versions of the story The King and the Guest. One exists in Flatjarbok, the other in Heimskringla. In both versions, King Olafur is entertained at a banquet by Odin in disguise, who tells him stories of the pagan king Orgvaldr who had worshipped a sacred cow. The king later realises that the hooded man was Odin, and that he had left two sides of beef in the kitchen which had since been cooked with the rest of his food. The king had all the food thrown out, saying that Odin must not be allowed to do anything to deceive us. This implied that the sides of sacrificial meat are, in some sense, derived from the long dead cult cow of King Orgvaldr which itself may symbolise the primordial cow of the Norse cosmogenesis, Aldumbla. Since cattle are actually offered as sacrifice to many gods in each pantheon, we cannot easily reconstruct an exclusive connection of the Sky Father to cow sacrifice using, for example, Greek sources, in which cattle can be offered to Athena or Hera or Zeus, even Poseidon received bull sacrifices. The Sky Father also might have been associated with bulls. Poseidon was, as already mentioned, partly derived from the Sky Father. Zeus himself turned into a bull to seduce Europa and thereby founded the dynasty of Minos, which retained taurine features right down to the Minotaur. We can't be certain Zeus's taurine aspect isn't from a pre-Indo-European Minoan influence though. Vedic sources are also of limited use in proving the bull association, since the early Vedic sources refer to Dyaus, Indra, Braspati, Agni and others as bulls, and to Varana as the bringer of the bull. In later sources we even see Shiva directly hailed as he who has the bull for his ensign. Eagles are often associated with the Sky Fathers in Indo-European religions, and are also a symbol of nobility, but their connection to the original Sky Father is dubious. In Rome, the eagle was a symbol of the military and of the authority of Jupiter. It comes directly from Greek influence where the eagle was associated with Zeus. However, Zeus was not always associated with eagles. An essay from Milanus and colleagues in 1946 claimed that the eagle could not have been present in the cult of Zeus in northern Greece prior to the early 5th century before Christ, but that it had older roots in the Peloponnesus. They conclude that the eagle was first conceived as a companion of Zeus and as his attribute around the altar of Mount Lycaon during the late 8th century before Christ. Odin is very strongly associated with eagles too and is even called Arnhufti, the eagle-headed. We also see that raptors play a role in the cosmology, with a hawk and an eagle perched on top of the Germanic world tree. However, archaeology indicates that falconry did not arrive in Scandinavia until the Migration Era, which is also the exact time when raptors became prominent in Germanic art which is obviously far too recent to be used as evidence in a claim of Proto-Indo-European origins. 
One animal that was of unquestionable significance in the religion of the Proto-Indo-Europeans was the wolf. Chris Kershaw's The One-Eyed God, Odin and the Indo-Germanic Menabunda, explains how the Indo-European warrior caste was centered around a wolf cult pertaining to a dark god who was connected to the souls of the dead. Among the Norse, this is clearly Odin and the Ulfhedner, wolf-headed, warriors or berserkers. While in Rome, we see it manifested in the festival of Lupercalia, which derives from lupus, meaning wolf. It involved bands of young men, led by the Brothers of the Wolf, chasing young women through the streets and whipping them with goat hide in order to make them fertile. It is also worth noting that the name of Mount Lycaon, where Zeus became associated with eagles, is related to the Greek word for wolf, so perhaps he was associated with wolves before eagles. The details of the Indo-European wolf cult are too lengthy and complicated to explain here as it really deserves its own video, but needless to say, all evidence, including very early archaeology from the steppes, shows that there was a warrior cult for young men who became like wolves or dogs. We can't be certain the god of this cult was always the Sky Father, but he seems the most likely candidate. The original, prehistoric, Proto-Indo-European religion was practiced from around six and a half to four and a half thousand years ago. We reconstruct it with linguistics, comparative mythology and archaeology and it's amazing how much we can learn about something so old. But the picture is still very far from complete. However, I hope this introduction to the Sky Father has sparked your interest in the topic of Indo-European religion. Thank you for watching. Do take a look at some of my other videos on ancient Indo-European religions, genetics and folk customs if you want to learn more. And don't forget to hit subscribe and the notifications bell. You can also access exclusive private videos which I make just for patrons if you sign up for either Patreon or Subscribestar for as little as the price of a pint per month. The links for these are in the description. If you support me, you will be ensuring this channel continues to survive and celebrate ancient European history for years to come. So thank you so much.